call this meeting of the Brockton School Committee to order and ask you to please join me in the National Anthem. Now, now how about the Pledge of Allegiance? I don't sing all that well. Let's try National, um, let's try Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. If I start singing, we'll clear the room like a fire drill. <coughs> okay. Uh, we open each school committee meeting with a uh, hearing of visitors. This is an opportunity for any member of the community uh, to sign in, uh, to have a chance to speak directly to myself, the superintendent, tonight's case, the deputy superintendent, and the school committee. Uh, we ask that you observe a three minute time limit and uh, understand that all matters are taken under advisement. There'll be no immediate direct response from the committee. So having said all that, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Sue Doherty uh, for an opportunity to speak. Hi. Um, good evening, Sue. So, good evening. Uh, thank you for hearing me. Uh, my name is Sue Doherty and I'm a librarian at the high school. I've been at the high school since 1999. I started as an English teacher and transferred to the library in uh, 2004 and then there were layoffs in 2010 and I went back to English for a year and now I'm back in the library and my, I'm speaking tonight because it's not about my job or about me. Um, I'm also on the MTA Board of Directors. I represent the paraprofessionals in Brockton. I represent the teachers in Brockton and the teachers in Stoughton on the MTA. Uh, be, I'm a BEA representative. Um, speaking for the paraprofessionals um, and the teachers and the students in Brockton, um, my concern is the elimination of so many library positions. There were seven library positions left in the district for 24 schools. Six of them are small schools, but there are, you know, 10 elementary schools, one K to eight. Uh, I think there were five or six middle schools in the high school. And what I heard last Friday, which shocked me because I just thought it was pink slips, was that five of those positions were being eliminated. And the concern I have is that the loss of libraries in general. You know, I feel that it's short-sighted and it's very easy right now. A lot of people are eliminating libraries and because I think they feel like we have Google and we don't really need libraries anymore. But I'm um, telling you, I work with the kids every day and they're really lost on Google. They don't really understand great resources that we have, like databases and things like that. Um, they don't know what a reference source is. They don't understand basic concepts. And they don't see books. Like, to the, they just see words on a screen. So they don't really understand, like, when they're looking at information, what it is, where it comes from. Those are the kinds of things that we do and that's something that paraprofessionals are being asked to do at elementary level that I don't think is fair that they should be asked to be teaching um, classes and uh, taking a professional position. We have master's degrees. We've been trained in um, adolescent and children's literature, uh, technology, uh, many, many things that um, they just didn't have the training in, you know, that you would have at a master's level for somebody who might have had a high school degree. And um, to put them in the position of teaching classes is very unfair to them, for one. So that's one reason I want to speak for them, because I feel like that's what's going to happen. And the middle school I'm concerned about right now, I know that a lot of the middle schools don't have libraries at all because the librarians were laid off. And that's a, an age that kids, you lose the readers at middle school age. Uh, a lot of research has shown that if the kids don't have access to uh, reading materials in middle school, then they may not become readers. I have, I had a summer, uh, one year I was doing summer orientation and I told a student I was a librarian and she was so excited. She said, oh, finally we have a librarian because she had come from a middle school where they didn't have one. Um, you know, kids don't, can't always go to the public library. I, a girl was begging me for a book recently because it was out and um, I said, can you go to the public library and get it? She said, my father doesn't let me go there because, you know, I mean, it can be dangerous and sometimes, you know, at night their parents don't want them out because of the things that are going on in Brockton. So we're one of the few places they can get a book and they can get one from a paraprofessional. But again, the idea is that we can, uh, we have the training to know um, the authors and the sometimes paraprofessionals have ordered books that were really developmentally inappropriate that we had to take off the shelves because they just didn't really belong in that level. Um, so 
and again, I totally respect the paraprofessionals, so that is not a put down of the paraprofessionals at all. It's just a difference in training. Um, I think you can all agree a difference in master's degree and high school diploma has some training behind it. Um, we, we talk about, uh, and stop me if I go too long because I didn't get a chance to practice. College and career ready, um, you know, what is college? College is reading and research. That's what we do. That's what libraries are about, is reading and research. So I just hope that if you do reconsider any of the eliminations or anything with money that you do think about the libraries in a different way. Um, I'd be happy to show people what, anything I've done and talk to any school committee member, come to my library, um, you know, see what the students are doing, um, look at some of the projects, talk to them, um, and thank you. That's all I want to say. You're welcome. Okay, Sue was the only person who signed in for hearing of visitors. <clears throat> so on the agenda, we'll move on to the consent agenda, which is fairly lengthy tonight. Uh, on the consent agenda, for those of you that are not regulars, it is the manner in which the school committee is able to conduct uh, routine business as a block to expedite the meeting and keep it moving along. However, <clears throat> before we vote on a consent agenda, uh, any school committee member reserves the right to withdraw any individual item from the consent agenda for separate discussion. So uh, at this time I'll ask if there are any members of the school committee that would like to uh, remove any items from tonight's consent agenda for individual discussion. Well, hearing and seeing none, I'll... Uh, okay, motion has been made. Properly seconded to approve the consent agenda as presented. All in favor? Opposed? Passes unanimously. So, uh, at this time, uh, I'll turn things over to Deputy Superintendent Thomas for the superintendent's report on learning and teaching. Thank you, Mayor Carpenter. As always, we start with uh, Jessica Freeborn, our representative from Broughton High School. So, thank you, Jessica. Okay, so first off, I would like to give a big congratulations to our drama club and their magnificent performance of Anything Goes this past weekend. I had the privilege of going to the Saturday show, and it was phenomenal. The acting was just incredible, and it was wonderful. I was, I was speechless. So congratulations to the gr drama club and everyone who helped out, and thank you to everyone in the community who attended. That was just a great turnout all three nights. Um, Math MCAS was today and is also tomorrow. So to our sophomores, great job today. And make sure you get a good night's sleep and eat a great breakfast. So good luck to all of you taking the test tomorrow. And Science MCAS is June 8th and 9th. And don't miss out on the last concert of the year. Wednesday, May 27th is our Pops concert at 7 p.m. in the auditorium. So it's going to be a great show. So don't forget to come to our Pops concert. And the seniors' last day of school is Wednesday, May 27th. The seniors' breakfast is Thursday, May 28th, and as is their prom. And the senior class elections for the class of 2016 are Friday, May 29th. And that's what's happening at Brockton High. Thank you. Yeah. I, I want to add that um, I was at Friday's performance of Anything Goes, and I had my three girls with me, and my little one doesn't sit still for anything even in, only if it's an ice cream, but she actually sat mesmerized during the, uh, during the show and it was great. So I want to congratulate um, Mr. Hogan, Bob Hogan, Vinnie Macrina, Sarah Richards, Brian Farrellock, and the entire staff that works with the kids at Broughton High. To, it's such, it's, it never disappoints. It's always a great show no matter what um, they select to perform and uh, they were tremendous. So uh, we pass along the congratulations to uh, Sharon Wolder, the principal, and uh, along to all the students and all the faculty that was involved in getting that show ready. So it was a great, it was a great performance. We thank you. Yes, and next we have Deputy Superintendent Elizabeth Barry will come up and um, give us an update on the strategic plan. Thank you. Good evening. Um, 
I'm going to give you a brief update tonight to talk to you about um, how we've been spending the past couple of months in updating our district strategic plan. I believe the last time we were here was about two months ago. So when the district strategic plan was launched last fall, it was comprised of four main strategic objectives, 24 strategic initiatives, and 77 proposed action steps, all of which fell under three main pillars of instructional excellence, supportive environment, and community engagement. The plan itself was very ambitious, um, and it was also intended to be a multi-year plan. So. Uh, in the fall into winter, we began working with the um, Delivery Institute, the U.S. Delivery Institute, um, which is funded by the Gates Foundation. And a lot of what we were doing was thinking about in year one um, how we take that plan, which is a multi-year plan with many, many things in it, and make it more actionable for one year. So in working with the Delivery Institute, um, we have established a clear agenda uh, for strategies for year one with measurable outcomes and targets and we maintained each of those three pillars within the strategic plan. We have main priorities for year one under instructional excellence which is that first main pillar or goal. One is collaborative culture. The second one is development and delivery of an aligned curriculum and assessment system, that's K-12. Student supports and interventions, part of that has a focus on reading by grade three. And then teacher growth and development. In order to keep us all accountable within the plan, um, the process requires that each goal has a, an owner and the strategies within each goal has owners as well. I'm the goal owner of instructional excellence and there are multiple strategy owners within this plan. Collaborative culture is owned by Clifford Murray and June Saber McGuire. The aligned curriculum and assessment is owned by Ethan Cancel. Student supports and interventions is owned by Laurie Mason and teacher growth and development is owned by Kathleen Moran and Carolyn Kopp who is one of our educator evaluation specialists. Within the second pillar, supportive environment, um, that focuses on two main priorities. The first one is short and long term needs of our facilities and the second one is school and district climate. These strategies seek to address the physical environment of our aging schools, their maintenance and our space needs related to the population that we serve. They also focus on the physical safety and emotional well-being of our students and staff and the development of alternative pathways is included in that school and district climate uh, priority as well. The goal of supportive environment is owned by Sal Tarasi and the strategy owners are Michael Thomas and Sal Tarasi as well. That third pillar of community engagement, it has two main priorities within it. The first one is engaging families and the second is school and community partnerships. This particular goal is owned by Kelly Jones, our Director of ESL and Bilingual Services and the strategies are owned by a combination of folks. Jocelyn Meek, who is our District Communications Officer, Jane Faroli, our Parent Family Engagement Specialist and Olga Gariga, who is our Assistant Director of Special Education. Goal owners and strategy owners are essential to the plan um, and if we're following the delivery planning process that we have learned through the Delivery Institute, um, one of the things that we've learned is by having goal owners and strategy owners, we're held accountable for achieving elements within our plan. So what does it mean to be a goal owner and what does it mean to be a strategy owner? The owners of goals and the owners of strategies have to coordinate and ensure that efforts are made across departments to meet these goals within the plan. They have to document an initiative's past, present and future and they also um, have to spend some time to ensure that they have the right folks enlisted in achieving these goals and achieving these strategies within the plan. Do they have the right people driving the work? 
Each strategy within each plan has its own strategy profile template or a delivery plan dedicated to it. What that means is that there are eight strategies for this year under the three pillars, instructional excellence, supportive environment, and community engagement. So they are actual plans within a plan, well articulated. Within these plans, district initiatives are articulated as well as progress to date. In many instances, we found that the district has made progress but is short of full implementation in a, on a lot of things that we might be working on. So partial progress is documented in each one of our plans. And then the next thing that we do is we actually have to talk a little bit about how we would define success we have to answer the question, in three years, what would look different in our schools and classrooms if we successfully implement this strategy? And by defining that definition, by taking that definition of success, we then begin to work backwards over three years. If that's where we want to be in three years, what kind of incremental steps do we have to take in order to get there in year one, year two, and year three? And that's part of the work that we've been doing. In creating a three-year plan, we also identify resources related to human capital, financial, technology, and facilities that we need in order to implement strategies within each plan. And most importantly, we establish feedback loops. Um, we're, we're focused on data, particularly student data, uh, that we will have to use to measure our progress. The last piece of this is we design delivery chains. And that's an example of a delivery chain. Um, at first glance, it looks like a mess. Um, however, if you look carefully, it ar carefully articulates how and through whom a specific strategy, um, the path that a specific strategy will take in order for it to get to that most critical level, which is all the way to the right up there, the classroom level to the teacher and student. This particular de delivery chain is focused on digital literacy and how we enhance digital literacy for our teachers as well as our students in our classrooms. And you see a couple of different colors there. One, um, one of the colors and the arrows talks about the ideal route of delivery, how we actually take something at the state level, um, a state mandate perhaps, how we push that all the way down to the classroom level by using district and school supports. And then you see another color which is actually uh, which is the actual delivery route. It's not uncommon for us to have an initiative and to say this is how it should ideally work through the system and the layers, um, but instead um, there's, a, there's a different way by which, there's a different path by which it takes. And by looking at um, ideal delivery versus actual delivery, we can begin to plan um, how we need to, what structures we need to change within the district so that we're making sure that we're getting down to that classroom level for teacher and student. So in completing <coughs> our, delivery ch our delivery plans, we're really able to identify the kinds of things that are going to get in the way of an initiative reaching from the state or district level all the way down to the classroom teacher. Um, and because there are eight strategies, there are, there are actually nine of these um, that we did in order to get this done. So the district strategic plan defines district initiatives and the school improvement plans that the schools are actually developing right now is where they talk about the school-based action steps that they will employ in order to, um, to make, make progress in um, the three key areas, instructional excellence, supportive environment, and community engagement. As a district, one of the things that we will do is we will have to review all of the school improvement plans to make sure that the initiatives that we have put forth in the district will directly support the work of schools. So although the, uh, the district strategic plan articulates district action steps, part of what we will have to do as part of our process is to really look at the types of um, initiatives that schools are employing and how the district is supporting the employment of those initiatives as well. At the 
at the conclusion of the school year, we're going to do what's called a stock take, um, and we're going to try it with that first pillar, which is instructional excellence. Um, and that will actually be something that we do with the Delivery Institute and with the superintendent. Um, and it will allow us, during that stock take, to do exactly what we should be doing at the end of year one, which is to evaluate the delivery of a specific set of activities. Um, we're going to update the superintendent on progress. We're going to use that time to make decisions on key actions and review data and hold ourselves accountable for the work that we're doing. The other thing that hopefully we'll be allowed to do is celebrate success when milestones are met. So that is the, that, that takes us through that first year. Um, we have limited information on what a stock take looks like and that's going to be the next um, layer of the work that we do with EDI. But we're going to try it on with that first with that first initiative and then continue to work on supportive environment and community engagement. Um, the other thing that you'll be getting uh, now that we've framed this is you, you'll actually be getting a copy of, of the plan and some of the strategy profile templates that we've done. Um, and we even have some delivery chains that we can share with you as well. Any questions about the strategic plan at this point? delivery that delivery chain mm -hmm. the red or brown would be the ideal and is this a blue uh, you had mentioned this so uh, there's an ideal route and yep. then there's the route that with yes. taking is mm -hmm. so the blue represents the route so that when we I take now so when I look at that one um, I would say that the blue is the ideal because we're the, the blue shows us that we're relying on different people within, a, in, within that district layer um, and it looks to me like the orange, the orange would be the less than ideal because we're bringing everything through one person or one department and that's not what we want to see. Because it seems like the delivery route mm -hmm. and the blue bypasses a lot right. of other people. Is mm -hmm. that why it's <coughs> ideal? Right. It, it w one of the things that we look for when we do this, they actually call it choke points, which is a little dramatic, but we want to make sure that we, are, that we have multiple layers and that we have folks at the district level reporting to specific people at the school level, yes. Right. And so what's happening here is we're looping around in some cases at the school level and we shouldn't be doing that. So that's not ideal then? No. Because did I just blue. say it backwards? Okay. Did I? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. So it's the, you can see that it's, it's blue and then it was sort of colored in orange. So how does um, potential budget cuts impact the delivery of these services to the classroom and to the teachers? Well, I, I would say that this, this exercise itself is helpful um, when you think about different positions, different structures that you need within the district. Um, because if you're taking an initiative or you're taking a message, so many times we get things from the state. We get a state mandate. We get an initiative that we have to um, that we have to implement. And a lot of what we do comes from that that state level Certainly. on the side. Mm -hmm. um, when when you think about budget cuts. Um, and when we see things directly going to certain areas that mm -hmm. we may have cut, we have to begin to think about what does a new delivery chain look like for us. Exactly. Yeah. How it impacts mm -hmm. the delivery of those services right. to the classroom. Right. Mm -hmm. That's helpful for us as a school committee. And we've, as contemplate. I said, we've done several of them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this one, to be honest, I picked this one because it was um, probably a little bit clearer than the others. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so they're somewhat hard to follow, um, but one of the things that um, EDI is going to do for us is they will take these pictures and they'll digitize, mm -hmm. so sort of the messes that we made will be a little bit clearer for everybody to see. Thank you, Liz. Mm -hmm. Sal, looking to add something? I saw your hand up. Do you want to? Yeah. So it's more of an example of what, it, what the process looks like rather than to take that as our final view of what this delivery chain looks like. 
Right. And that's also the rationale behind taking them and digitizing them because it allows us to manipulate them a little bit further. Over the three year period and the single year, I guess as you're dealing, is there places for review, corrective action, and then implementation of that so that by the time you end it the first year, you've had some chance to make corrections and actually implement those? Right. And that's the rationale behind what I understand to be this first stock take. Um, we will be setting up multiple stock takes for each of the three main areas for that purpose. Um, if there's one thing that the superintendent has said many, many times, and we all feel this way, we were not interested in developing a plan that was going to sit on the shelf. We wanted to revisit it, we wanted to revise it, and we wanted to be able to do that on a regular basis. When you go through the process of revision, you want it to be based on actual data. So so that you're not just revising something because it may be difficult to implement, but you're revising it and you're making a data-based decision on, on its revision. So when we do these stock takes, that will actually be part of what we're doing. So that regular cycle of checking in um, and seeing how we're doing with specific initiatives and what we need to modify or change will be part of that stock take process. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Barry. Thank you. Um, next, uh, I have um, some exciting news that um, the letter came on May 14th um, from the New England Association of Schools and Colleges, the NEASC, um, was the accreditation report that was done this last, uh, this past fall um, at Brockton High School. I'm going to bring Principal Sharon Wolder up. Um, and she's going to present, you know, parts of the letter that was received. I just wanted to point something out um, about Broughton High School. Um, as many of you know, there have been recent reports of um, um, issues with Broughton High um, related to culture and um, different things according to the handbook. But um, this was a committee of 30 people from, um, from all over the state of Massachusetts, but mostly from outside the state of Massachusetts that visited Broughton High that have never been to Broughton High School before. And um, one of the bullets they put in as an um, accommodation for Broughton High is they said that it is a safe, positive, supportive, and respectful cool school culture that emphasizes every student matters every day. So I thought that was an important bullet to point out because, again, those are people that have not been to Broughton High that come into a school of 4,200 students um, don't know what to expect when they come into a building with that many teenagers uh, and to come away with one of those comments I think is um, a credit to Ms. Wolder and the entire staff at Broughton High School and obviously to the students uh, of the representative of what the culture is like at Broughton High so I'll leave it to you Sharon and I'm sure there'll be some questions after that so thank you. Okay good evening and yes it is great news uh, as you recall, about two and a half years ago, I came before you to say we're getting ready to start the accreditation process, which included surveys of students, parents, faculty members. Uh, it also included an extensive self-study. We had to really take a look at our own practices, what we're doing well and what we need to work on to improve. And it was based on the standards that they provided for us. We wrote several reports, submitted those reports, and then in October, all of you had the joy of meeting uh, that committee of people who came to analyze Brockton High School. And quite honestly, uh, we all felt that they came in looking for things to be wrong. Uh, they asked us many questions. They challenged us on, on some things. We felt at times that we were totally misunderstood uh, because the school is so large and there are so many students and we had people coming from a number of different environments where the schools were smaller, uh, had fewer subgroups, a number of different things. So they had a lot of questions. Uh, they were critical and they kept pushing us on different things. They wanted more information, more information. So we went through uh, four days of enjoying their presence and giving them everything that they wanted while they were there and then months of back and forth with the reports because then there had to be a report written that they sent to us. We had to look at it, uh, make corrections where they had 
positions incorrect, uh, question some of the things that they thought that we thought were misrepresented, and then hear back from them what it was that they thought they saw, um, or the way they interpreted things that they saw. And there were certain things that they were. Um, relentless on. They were not going to change their point of view. Uh, there were other things that after they saw the school and saw that in this environment what can be done here is very different from a smaller school. Uh, they And NIASC understands that there are multiple ways to meet a standard and so we had a lot of conversations about that. In January, on the 15th of January, the final report was submitted to an independent committee. These were not the people who came to see us. They had to use that report to determine whether or not Brockton High School deserved to be accredited. And so we waited. And while we were waiting, by the way, and through all of the reports, uh, we did get the Newsweek designation for our work with students in low income. We got U.S. News and World Report most recently, a bronze medalist again, and we were identified as a model school. And those things are all great because it is about student achievement and the culture of the school, but they don't accredit us. And so as wonderful as they were, we were waiting, 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 and said, when is this coming? When is this coming? Uh, I sent an email at one point, and it was at the committee level, and we were told, remember, we have six months to give you a decision. And so when the letter came, it was quite a thrill. It was the first thing I looked at was the congratulations unanimously voted to be accredited. And so that was a powerful thing for our school, for all of the parents who supported us, for all of you. It really was a community effort to s let people see what Brockton High School is all about. And those people did see it. Uh, they did give us 32 recommendations, or commendations, excuse me. They said 32 great things about us and gave us 10 areas uh, over the next two years that we do need to do some work on, which are things that we knew uh, we were going to have to do some work on. One of their biggest, biggest criticisms, and they put it in two of the recommendations, was related to class size. And so we know that there are some things that are easy to address, creating rubrics and preparing those things, versus things that are a little more challenging to address uh, related to class size. But ultimately, we have to identify over the next two years uh, how we are going to address some of those recommendations. And it doesn't have to be all at once because five years from now there will be another report where they will expect everything to be addressed um, to some level. But we do have continued work to do to demonstrate not only did we get accredited, but we deserve to remain accredited. So uh, this was the first big step and, and what a joy because we have over 4,000 almost 200 students at that school and they continue to come and this is the, the high school of our city uh, that most kids want to be at and we want to make sure not only is it nationally recognized for its academic excellence but it's accredited because that matters for college. Any uh, questions or comments for Principal Um we most of us met with the um, with the visitors, and it was uh, you know it was a very good visit. They were they were very tough. I mean, they had some very pointed questions, but um, you know, like you said, one of the things they walked away with was um, the <coughs> the tone of the high school, uh, the caring nature of the students for one another. Um, they were very impressed with how. Um, the students treated special ed students, assisted uh, the programs that uh, have been instituted, I think um, are remarkable and um, beneficial for both the special ed students and, and as well as the general ed students. I think it, it uh, I think when you are involved in something like that, you, um, you grow as a person um, and you really find out what kind of character you have as a person. Um, so it, it, it was nice to hear that. Um, as I recall, some of the deficiencies, a lot of them are related to budget. You know, um, if, and we basically said to them, if we had a, an open checkbook, you know, there might be half of one thing on this list that you, you know, are noting as needs to be fixed. But uh, I thought um, they were very uh, open-minded. They, uh, there was no. Um, they were totally uh, unbiased, impartial, because you know they come from different places, especially the people from out of state. They don't have any connection to Massachusetts in general, to the colleagues that they 
you know, may know, they don't know anyone here. So there was, uh, there was no bias. Um, so it was, it, I thought it was a great report. Um, I'd like to thank you, your team, the teachers, and most of all the students for really showing what the high school is all about and um, for just um, you know, being uh, such a, a great group of students. So, great report. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. Great report. Congratulations. All right. Uh, earlier this evening, uh, there was a public hearing held on school choice. And uh, Mr. Minichello, should I direct it to you? Are we, how are we going to have? We're going to have a report first and then a vote? report. Okay. Um, like you said, Mayor Carpenter, we um, had a, a public hearing on school choice. Uh, that is a, a, an annual requirement pursuant to Chapter 76, Section 12B of the Massachusetts General Laws. At that hearing, uh, no one appeared at the hearing of visitors um, to testify either for or against. We then closed the hearing and uh, voted to adjourn. And um, that is basically the report of what occurred at the public hearing. Okay. So we're going to we accept the report and then go on to uh, the school committee taking a vote regarding school choice for this year. That's proper procedure. Yes. Okay. So the first motion we need then is uh, a motion to accept the report on uh, tonight's public hearing on school choice so as presented by Mr. Minicello. Motion has been made. Sure. Properly seconded by Mr. Jordan. All in favor? Approved unanimously. Now, would you like to offer a, uh, yeah, sure. I would, a motion, I would, Mr. Minchella? I would make a motion that we continue the school choice program as currently uh, in effect. Um, that's my motion, and then I would like to say something on the motion. Okay, so we've got a motion made, properly seconded, on the motion, Tom. Um, just to um, clarify, we have 23 students total that participate in school choice. Um, there are three that are not at the high school. One is, I guess, at Angelo, one at South, and one at West. And then the rest are at the high school, 20. Um, three in the ninth grade, four in the 10th grade, seven in the 11th, and sixth in the 12th. Um, I always think that um, my feeling is that this is a, a good way to showcase what's great about the Brockton Public Schools. Um, so I, I th these, these students obviously want to be here. They go back to their home communities and they basically, you know, express to their friends, family, um, neighbors, you know, why it is, why aren't they, you know, in West Bridgewater? Why aren't they in Bridgewater? No, I'd rather go to Brockton. And obviously there's a good reason why. Um, because we do have a lot to offer here. So um, I don't think that's an overwhelming number for a school system of 17,000 plus kids. I think we can absorb it in light of you know, what we are facing, but um, it's not as if 23 kids are in one class. They're dispersed all over the place. So um, I think it's a good thing for the city, and I'm obviously showing my hand, but that's the way I feel, and that's the how I would recommend this vote go. So. Anyone else on the motion? Mrs. Joyce. On those numbers that you shared with us, you mentioned three at the Angelo? Um, no. One at the Angelo, one at three that are not at the high school. Okay. One at Angelo, one at South, one at West. Okay. And then 20, are, it's a total of 23. 20 are dispersed throughout but the high school. But our policy calls for only 50 at the high school and up to 10 at Edison. So how do we have school choice students at any other schools. They must be here for... To be a child of a staff member. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I think we should make it clear that our school choice um, allows for up to 50 students. The current one that we have right now allows for up to 50 at the high school and up to 10 for Edison. So and clarified. We would, need, we would need to discuss that if we decided to open that up to other grade levels. Except that one exception. The one exception for staff members that's already in right, place. Right, yeah. right, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
They must be staff members' children, mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Okay, now that we've had that clarification, we've got a motion on the floor, properly seconded. Anyone else on the motion? All right, all in favor? Opposed? Passes unanimously. Uh, at this time, uh, we'll entertain uh, any items that any member of the committee uh, or the deputy superintendent may want to uh, refer to a subcommittee of the school committee. Uh, much of the work, probably the majority of the work that's done by the school committee is done uh, in working subcommittee sessions before being uh, brought forward to the full school committee. It's where a lot of the heavy lifting is really done. And uh, each, at each meeting, we give members an opportunity to uh, request that a topic be referred to a subcommittee. So at this time, is there any item that any member of the school committee or the deputy superintendent would like to refer to a subcommittee? I think we have an ongoing list um, that Mrs. Alves has, but that has basically been postponed due to all of the meetings that we've currently finance. had with respect to finance and with respect to negotiations etc so yeah. when superintendent smith gets back um, i'm sure she'll contact the committee and we'll send out a you know, request for a day available dates and hit that list because there are some ongoing issues that have already been identified i have a couple of items that i spoke to the superintendent about before she left okay. uh, one is we'd like to schedule um, finance subcommittee meeting because we know that there's a lot more work to do on the um, mm -hmm. the budget so we'd like to uh, schedule something if we could check for uh, next Tuesday I know we try to stick to Tuesday mm -hmm. nights um, that would be a meeting at 630 at the unknown so um, we could either make that decision now or, or we can you could touch base with Wanda and we can try to get that meeting scheduled within the next couple of days that'd be Tuesday at 630 that's the 26th. I mean, 26. It's good for me. I don't know if it's good for everyone else. 26 and 6:30. I mean, for a lunch time. Yep. At the Arnold. And if it's unavailable, Wanda, Mrs. Alves will tell us an alternative site if it's unavailable. So. So we'll We'll confirm with everyone by email. Okay. So tentatively, uh, finance subcommittee next Tuesday, 6:30 at the Arnold School. And the other thing she wanted me to. Um, remind the school committee of is that um, she needs a meeting of the superintendent's um, contract committee and this is strictly for her evaluation um, her evaluation is would be due soon so she would ask you to schedule a meeting um, you know it's called her contract committee but it's strictly for her evaluation for this past school year Tom do you want to try to set that one up by email uh, yeah superintendent Smith will be back on uh, Wednesday or Thursday, I think. A Thursday. So, yeah, so we'll figure out a All right, date. so that one we'll leave it to the vice chair to work something out with the superintendent and then uh, get it out to all the members by email if that's okay with everyone. Okay? Thank you. All right. Anyone else with anything they'd like to get in front of a subcommittee? No? Okay. Then we'll move on. Uh, next item on the agenda is unfinished business. The FY, uh, an update on the FY 2016 budget um, and if it's okay with the committee I'd like to give you a quick update on overall funding and then we can uh, ask Mr. Petronio to come up and, and update the committee. Um, when I sent over to you my original draft budget for the school department for this year back about three or four weeks ago, uh, the non-net figure, the, the local aid for non-net school, um, which one we know, net school spending, I'm sorry. Local aid for net school spending, uh, we sent over a figure of $163 million for this year. That was an increase of just under $3 million. It was essentially designed to be a pass-through of the increase in Chapter 70 local aid from the state, which although reported at $5 million, uh, was actually $3.9 million because we just had a conversation about school choice. School choice cuts both ways. We have students from Brockton that go out to charter schools or other school systems and we're charged back for those students. Last year, uh, in FY15 last year, we were charged back a total of $4 million against our Chapter 70 aid to cover the cost of students going to school outside of the district. 
Uh, and that's money we never receive. They take it right off the top. Uh, this year, that figure went up to 5.1 million, an additional deduction of 1.1 million. So the theoretical 5 million that was reported in additional Chapter 70 was not 5 million because the deduction went up by 1.1, so it was really 3.9. And then from that, there were additional expenses, Schedule 19 expenses, primarily for health insurance increases that took another 800000 out of that. So the true net figure of increase in Chapter 78 coming to the city this year uh, from the state, give or take a few dollars, was about $3.1 million. You good with that, Aldo? Yes. Okay. All right. So at that point, we were essentially trying to make sure we passed through the net increase while we continue to look for additional funds. And I, I made the commitment to the committee that you know, our goal was to try to get as close to 165 million as we could, uh, but we had a lot of work to do. Uh, last Wednesday, uh, faced with the prospect of what would have been, in my opinion, catastrophic layoffs, uh, I agreed to commit an additional 1.5 million for net school spending uh, to the school budget, although we didn't actually have the money in hand yet. I've got to tell you that on the city side, because I have to look at the entire picture, before sending that additional 1.5 million last Wednesday, uh, we're faced with a $4.2 million deficit in the city budget. Um, I think everyone knows we had a lot of snow last year, historic snowfall. and even though we budgeted a reasonable amount of uh, 2.2 million for snow removal, we spent 4.7 million. I mean, it was unprecedented. Four major storms in less than three weeks with no melt at all in between any of the storms. And we continue to lobby and look for uh, federal aid that you know we think eventually we'll get about $700,000. Barely makes a dent in the almost $5 million bill for snow removal. Uh, so in any event, sending the 1.5 million last Wednesday allowed the number of RIF notices to be less than they would have been otherwise. And I understand it's still a very large number that will have an impact. I'm just saying it would have been a lot worse without the additional 1.5 million. That did drive the city deficit up to 5.7 million. And that's what we're contending with on the city side. And when I present my budget to the City Council a week from Monday, that budget will have to include a plan as to how we're overcoming that $5.7 million deficit with some combination of increased revenues and painful cuts. Uh, so prior to today, our net school spending was at $164.5 million. Uh, our non-net school spending, which is essentially transportation, I had level funded at the roughly $7 million of last year. So that you know, almost every single city department on the city side is level funded, with the exception of police, I think, had an increase. Um, and many departments are getting less. But I did level fund the transportation at $7 million. Uh, earlier this evening, uh, the CFO and I uh, finalized our school um, our financing of the uh, school department budget for this year and I'm, I'm pleased to tell you that we are sending an additional 1.1 million to the schools. Uh, 572,500 in terms of net school spending which gets us up just a little over the 165 million and an additional 600,000 for non-net school spending uh, because it was apparent to me that there have been increases in the cost of transportation this year. It's still about a million dollars less than the school committee was asking for. Uh, but without that $600,000, I think that student transportation would have been seriously jeopardized for uh, mainstream traditional students. Uh, so at $165 million, uh, we're now up a little over $2 million uh, from the original budget. That puts us now $4.1 million over last year's uh, funding for net school spending. So I just want to emphasize, I, I have people approach me that feel as though we've cut local aid to, uh, to the school district and it's just not the case. It's an increase now of $4.1 million 
plus the increase of 600,000 on the non-net side for a total increase of 4.7 million dollars to schools this year. It's about a 3% increase. It's almost five million dollars. I am telling you it is the absolute best we can do. And I do not anticipate any future increases in that number. I've tried to bring you everything I possibly could tonight so that the school committee would have some time to make some tough decisions to decide how to best serve the needs of the students with the money that we have available. Um, it does not mean that we're not continuing to look for money everywhere we possibly can. Uh, last Wednesday I was down in Washington. I met with Senator Markey and uh, the Senator's office is continuing to try to help us lobby for additional funding for the schools for technology under the E-rate program. There's no guarantee other than the fact that we're trying. Um, this week actually on the same day we did receive some slight modifications in how FEMA will reimburse the city uh, for snow removal and where it impacts the schools is FEMA decided that they would now allow money for removing snow off of roofs uh, to be submitted for potentially 75 percent reimbursement. Uh, on the city side that has very little impact but on the school side uh, I know that uh, the superintendent Mike and Ken are working very hard on putting those figures together with Aldo uh, but it, it's potentially some maybe an additional hundred thousand dollars or so uh, could come back to the schools uh, whatever comes back for that I will pass through um, I also yesterday sent out about 20 letters to um, nonprofits in the city and I think you know it's no secret that I've asked nonprofits for some help in the past um, we have not received any new help other than from a couple of nonprofits that gave to us in the past. We have some major nonprofit organizations in the city uh, that really put a significant drain on city resources around public safety, police, and fire, which are the other two of the big three budgets that we have here in the city, along with schools. And back in January, I sent out requests to the nonprofits asking them to make a voluntary payment to the city of 10 percent of what their property tax bill would have been had they been subject to tax. The original ask is for 30 percent because we spend a little over one-third of our city budget on police and fire and those are services that are directly drawn upon by all of these nonprofit associations and I'm not talking about houses of worship, I'm not talking about small volunteer organizations. I'm talking about most cases multi-million dollar organizations that have CEOs making six-figure incomes like High Point, like Brockton Hospital, like the YMCA, like the Neighborhood Health Center, like BAMSI. I mean I think we do have organizations in the city that could help us. Um, and of that 30 percent ask, we only asked for one-third of that this year with the idea that we would phase in the voluntary ask over three years. Um, to give you an example, um, the uh, Good Samaritan Hospital, now owned by Steward Healthcare, pays about $2.3 million in property taxes. The Brockton Hospital, as a nonprofit, pays zero. I will tell you that we deploy police and fire resources to that facility on almost a daily basis. Um, High Point, and people know I certainly am an advocate for treatment and believe in everything High Point does, uh, but this past year on their, their campus consists of two parcels of property that they were leasing. So the owner of the property was paying property taxes. Um, the uh, during this past year High Point purchased one of those parcels from the owner that piece of property last year paid seventy five thousand dollars in property taxes to the city um, this year it pays zero so High Point through its rent was paying seventy five thousand on that parcel last year this year they paid zero you know we could call back two teachers with that money that we lost um, so 
I sent out letters to those organizations yesterday renewing my request for assistance, outlining to them the difficult budget circumstances we find ourselves under, and pledging that any voluntary payments that they make for this fiscal year will be passed through 100% to the school budget to help us recall laid off school personnel. So any help you can give me in convincing some of those organizations to step up and help us during this crisis, whatever they agree to voluntarily pay us, I will pass through to the school budget, every single penny of it. Um, so I'm trying. And I can't help but remind folks that, you know, earlier this year, uh, I settled a long-standing lawsuit for the development of an electric power plant. Uh, if that plant were in operation this year, it would pay a guaranteed $4 million to the city. There would not be a budget cut. I could find the other million in savings, and there would not have been one single layoff. Uh, so I would also ask you to ask your city councilors to withdraw their obstruction of that settlement in federal court and allow us to move forward uh, with the development of that plant that is coming anyhow, but the longer we delay it, the more money we're losing. As part of that settlement, there's an immediate lump sum payment to the city of $2.85 million the day the shovel breaks the ground. And I've pledged one million of that 2.85 to the schools. A million for public safety, a million for schools, and 850,000 for parks and recreation. Um, so we are looking to get every potential source of revenue we can. And it's clear that with the state continuing to underfund the needs of an urban gateway city like Brockton, who takes on the most challenged students we have in the state, and the most expensive students to educate. And we take the challenge on willingly, uh, and uh, we embrace it. But you know, about one third of our students are, are still learning to be proficient in English. 80% of our students live below the poverty level. Um, and we have a significant number of students who receive special ed services from what I believe to be the best special ed department in the state but it's all very expensive. And as much as the affluent suburbs want to complain that they don't think they're getting their fair share, they don't take on the challenge that we take on. And the funding we're getting from the state is insufficient. But in the meantime, all I can do is try to find additional sources of revenue and uh, do the best I can to get money over to you. So there's a little more money. I know you have tough decisions to make, but I know that uh, Having sat in your seat for four years and done four school budgets myself, um, I know that uh, you'll allocate it where you feel it'll do the best good. So having said that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Petronio. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we appreciate the additional funds. Uh, at this point, what we have is a balanced budget with 173 cuts. So moving forward now that you've given us these additional funds, the school committee and the superintendent and I will all meet to see um, how to best utilize those funds, how um, an overall plan would be put in place that would bring back not only positions, but also programs for the students. So um, I assume next Tuesday night, that's what we started with. And, uh, you know, and for the superintendent, I'd like to say thank you for finding those funds for us and actually finding them this quickly, because I didn't think we'd hear about it in, for another couple of weeks until you know, your budget was into council. And committed to the money, I'm <laughs> I haven't exactly figured out how we're paying for it yet. <laughs> uh, but I've got a, a little more than a week to do that. But it's, it's tough decisions all over the place. There just isn't enough money. <laughs> But I do want to dispel the notion that we cut school funding because school funding is up almost $5 million this year. Thank you. And I, I have to mention, obviously, that you know Friday was a tough day in the Brockton Public Schools for 173 people that received RIF notices. And ob obviously, uh, I had to give out a few of those along with several department heads and principals. And it's, it's, it's never easy. Um, you know, and we ask people to, it's hard to ask people that just lost their job to tell them that they're not going to have a job in September to kind of be patient, but we are working hard and Mayor Carpenter and Jay Condon have been with us side by side and trying to find as much money as possible. Um, the executive team started work today. 
on um, finding other places um, to find more money to uh, make decisions on how to bring people back that were that were rift. Um, so we know it's a, it was a difficult day in the school system, and it's always heartbreaking on uh, when you have to give out um, the so-called pink slips. Um, but we have until the end of the school year, which is June 26th, before um, anybody collects unemployment. So we will do our best um, within the confines of our budget, trying to work hard, and we already started that today, to look at other areas where we can save money, um, and also looking at saving money this year so we can pre-buy for next year and, and save even more money. So uh, that's the work we're doing now. Um, and you know, I want to thank the mayor and also uh, Jay Condon, who's been coming over to Central uh, quite often to work with us um, closely, and also has been at our subcommittee meetings, finance subcommittee meetings. So he has been a huge help in helping us, um, you know, go through this tough time and figure out we can find every time we can possibly find. So uh, obviously, we'll continue to do that work, and we still. Uh, have time. June 26 will be here quickly, but uh, we'll be working and doing everything we can together, obviously with the, with you, to uh, to find every dime possible. Any discussion, Mr. Minicello? In um, monies paid to outside entities for out of district tuitions, is there a way to get an itemization from the state in terms of? You know where those monies are going, where to find out where the increase from last year to this year was. You know, it's, it, as the mayor said, we all saw it in our Schedule 19 that um, it went up a little more than a million dollars. Right. Yes, I'm actually working on that, trying to identify because what we want to do now is the, the fact that it grew so dramatically in one year. Right. We want to look at those students and see what addresses they're they're really at, and see where they're going and why. Um, you know, most of it is to charter schools. And we want to see what charter schools and where, and are they truly Brockton residents? Right. So I am working on that, and that information does come from the Department of Ed. Okay, great. It has nothing to do with the vocational technical school. Right. That's oh, that's totally separate. Just for yeah, people no, that are no, no. watching, that's strictly uh, charter schools and school choice going to other school districts. Correct. Yeah. And you're right, it, it, it sure does seem like a big bump in one year. Mm -hmm. And now maybe folks can understand why we uh, were so opposed to that last charter school proposal because we know what the impact on our budget would have been. Um, okay. Anything else on updating the, uh, the budget? All right. So we'll go on to new business. Aldo, I think you might want to stay there. Um, under new business, uh, we have the closing of the fiscal year 2015 oh. budget. Yes, at the finance committee meeting last week, um, usually every year, sometime after you know January, February, depending on how the budget looks and how the coming year is looking, um, I look across all the accounts and see the spending that's happening, and um, look for the right opportunity of when budgets should, should be closed. I don't want to close them before principals have had a chance to buy testing materials and such they need for their budgets. But once they've gone beyond that point, I speak to a lot of principals and find out where they are. And then we look to basically shut down the budget, which means only bills that we have contracted to pay, such as electricity, gas, you know, items that we're still waiting to come in are what we allow to go through. Um, and I will repeat, as I do every year, I've never had to say no to a principal who's called me after this point and said there's a certain item that they need for their school and they can't get by without it we go to that pool of funds and we take care of that principal, whatever they need. Um, then the pooled funds that are left at the end, I use to pre-purchase for the next year to offset the budget. So the items that we pre-purchase are paper supplies, chemicals for cleaning, and um, out of district tuitions for special ed that's allowed by the law that I can pay up to three months worth. And our out of district budget is around $10 million. So there's plenty um, of, of ability in there to pay ahead whatever funds are left at the end of each year. And as soon as I do that, I remove that from the next year's budget so that we know um, we've reduced the needs next year by that amount. And that, again, helps us offset any potential layoffs or refs that happen. Any further questions or discussion for Mr. Petronio regarding uh, closing out of the FY15 budget? Yes. 
we have to, do you need a motion and a vote? Yes. So the motion is to authorize you to go ahead and close the budget for FY15? Right. Okay. Motion made by Mr. Minicello, seconded by Mr. Jordan to uh, authorize uh, the superintendent uh, and the CFO to close out the FY15 school budget. All in favor? Opposed? Passes unanimously, Wanda. All right. I think that's all we've got on the regular agenda other than any other new business. Andy. Yep, absolutely. Last week we had a um, referendum vote. Um, and I just want to note that for the second straight election, I guess the fall election being the, the last one, um, we had Brockton High School students working at the polls. Um, 20 or so students this time um, worked the polls like regular poll workers, got paid like regular poll workers. Um, working with Ms. Connors and Mr. McGarry. Um, Mr. McGarry came from the elections office here to the high school to train the students. Um, and they were out there working from open to close on election day. Um, and uh, actually at my polling place, the War Memorial building, um, there was a young woman working there. And when I went in, I said, a student over at the high school? And she said, no, I'm actually home from college. I worked at the polls last year as a senior. And because I got home for college in time for the referendum vote, uh, Mr. McGarry asked me if I'd work again. And so uh, a Brockton High graduate choosing to, to do that again, um, I just think it's an awesome opportunity, something that's really great for our students. Um, I wanted to highlight it in case folks saw young people out at the polls. Um, that's what it is. And in a lot of cases, they're actually serving to support interpretation services at the polls. A lot of our students um, you know, speak their native languages. Um, you know, whether those languages are spoken at home or not and, and can provide those kind of crucial um, services at the polls that some of our older poll workers um, aren't always able to. Um, I think it's a partnership that Mr. McGarry's been trying to develop for a while and, and for two straight elections now we've been fortunate enough to create opportunities and spaces for students and uh, I just hope it's something that will continue. So, Absolutely. Great program. Thank you. for. Uh Ms. Connors and Mr. McGarry and anyone else that's uh, giving our young people a chance to participate. Still under new business. Anyone else have anything else they'd like to mention under new business? Superintendent, uh, Deputy Superintendent Thomas, that the musical was excellent. I mean, uh, I usually go to them all, but this one really floored me. Um, yeah. The singing. The lead was incredible. Um, she was wonderful, uh, and so were the uh, other singers. Uh, it was just a um, entertaining musical. Um, the theme was was just fun. It was just yeah. a fun, a fun musical, and um, you know all the students who participated and, and staff uh, they did a wonderful job. And 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 there's volunteers as well um, uh, from the outside that are neither staff nor students that uh, assist. Mr. Hogan, um, and, and we thank them for their volunteerism. Um, so, outstanding. All right, job well done. Anyone else for new business? I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Motion made and seconded, and all in favor? Passes unanimously. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>